I can't believe on a topic like financing, we aren't, there aren't literally hundreds of, of people wanting to participate. Not, not, yeah, well, we had, I think, 60 or 70, 70 who registered. So hopefully we'll get a few more folks. Um, we'll give them a minute. Um, but yeah, I think it's for, it's probably because of you, Mark. Just... <laughs> All right, well, I guess we can get started. We're, we're a minute past the hour. Welcome folks, we're, we're a small group today, um, but that's okay. Hopefully we can have some, some solid discussion and um, we record these calls. So any folks uh, who didn't get to see can find them on our website. Um, I'm Isaac Longobardi. I'm, I'm the chair of the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition. I work closely with uh, my colleagues, Alice Bonner, who, uh, did I call myself the chair? I'm the director of the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition. And Alice Bonner, my colleague, is the chair of the Moving Forward Nursing Home Quality Coalition. Um, she's at uh, the National Governors Association Conference today, um, and so cannot join us. And, and uh, our other colleague, Sumeri Maki, who's the program manager, um, also works closely with us. Um, and I'm I'm delighted to be presenting today with, with Mark Cohen, who chairs our finance committee alongside David Grabowski um, and Charlie Sabatino, who's uh, worked closely um, with the uh, person-centered care committee and now chairs their work group on household model expansion uh, across the country. Um, uh, Charlie and Mark will give an overview of um, our work on financing uh, household models, which is uh, both broad and deep, um, and hopefully, uh, you know, has has the capacity to be quite um, impactful. And then we'll open it up for for questions and and conversation further. So um, uh, we're psyched to hear from you guys, um, and you know, also feel free to use the chat uh, both if you'd like to introduce yourself. Um, and also to uh, ask questions as we go. Um, Mark, if you could share my slides or our slides, that would be super, super helpful. Um, and uh, I'll just give a, a very quick flash in the pan overview of the coalition. Many of you will know about us. And if, if you don't already, uh, you can learn more um, on our website where all this uh, uh, information lives. And you'll have to pardon me for a second. I just need to find my participants tab to make sure I can let people in. Um, so uh, next slide, Mark. Uh, so the Moving Forward Coalition is generously funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation. Uh, the foundation was uh, one of the funders of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine report on nursing home quality that came out in April, 2022. Um, and you know they wanted to be good stewards of the uh, report. Um, and make sure that the tremendous recommendations that came out of it didn't sit on a shelf. So uh, in partnership with Leading Age, uh, the convener, uh, they brought together this coalition. Um, and we have spent uh, the last few months uh, prioritizing uh, recommendations from the report uh, and developing action plans um, to activate uh, those recommendations. Um, and in this second year of our work, we're taking those action plans and, and, and really making them happen. And so we're excited to uh, share with you um, our progress. Next slide. Um, so I went over this, you can, you can skip this, but we'll, we'll go, we'll talk, or actually, I guess I didn't so much. So we did, so we're, we're doing our welcomes. Um, we'll describe the action plans this action plan in particular on household model expansion, why it's important um, and what we are trying to accomplish with it. Um, 
And, and looking at sort of the high level of household model expansion across the country at both the state and federal level. And then we'll do a little bit more of a deep dive into our, our work on, on HUD's 232 mortgage insurance program. Uh, and we'll end with some progress to date and of course, conversation with you all. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I went over this, but you know it, it bears repeating that our, our purpose is about action. This is not about more reports. It's about developing, testing, and promoting uh, the actions, some of which exist, some of it which we're developing now um, in, in partnership with a number of organizations and individuals across the country um, to improve nursing home resident quality of life. Uh, next slide, please. And, uh, you know, very important, we start everything we do um, with, with the people who live and work in nursing homes. Um, it was fundamental to our prioritization process and the way we planned um, our work over this past year to think about how our work will impact um, the residents and the staff in nursing homes and ensure that their quality of life and work improves. Um, and we believe in doing that through the power of policy um, and practice changes. Charlie, did you have a, a thought? Yeah, well, let me jump in here uh, with our, to, get, to give a, get into our action plan, which is titled Financing Household Models and Physical Plant Improvements. Uh, next slide. Wh why this is important? Well, um, we know that there's a need for significant improvements in quality of care and nursing home structures go hand in hand with that in order to provide residents with safe individualized uh, care for very often complex care needs. Both the administration uh, and the National Academy of Sciences have clearly identified the need to reduce resident room uh, size uh, and crowding as a key priority. And physical plant improvements can much more enable person-centered, uh, uh, person-directed care and better health outcomes. And, and when I say physical plant improvements, we're talking about private rooms, private bathrooms, uh, greenhouse style nursing homes, for those of you who know greenhouse homes, which are very home-like with kitchens and units, uh, no more than uh, a dozen or so residents. Although there's no specific number, uh, I mean, numbers for what a small household model looks like, uh, I've seen up to 24. Uh, so there's no single uh, cap that everyone agrees upon, but it's certainly very different than what we have now. Um, on the next slide, um, the, the particular vision of, of our uh, uh, focus has been that nursing home residents will live in smaller home-like houses or apartments. Sometimes these can be stacked upon each other in an apartment-type building with private rooms and baths, open kitchen, and cross-trained and powered staff teams. And that latter part is important because even though we're focused on the physical plant, you, you can you can change a nursing home into a small uh, household model physically, but if you don't also attach the culture change to that, you'll only uh, get a half-baked outcome from that. <clears throat> so this uh, uh, particular action plan resulted in the work of, of Mark's uh, and David Grabowski's finance committee, uh, along with the what began as work within the committee on persons directed care uh, and care planning. Uh, in which we realized in that committee that, look, if we can't even uh, uh, recognize and, and, and honor residents' desire for privacy, uh, having their own room, then how can we talk about resident-directed uh, uh, care? So uh, we became a work group and then combined with the Finance Committee to produce this action plan to explore options with both federal and state agencies to incentivize the transition away from legacy buildings to household models. Now, I can't emphasize enough why this is important. Uh, uh, and if we go to the next slide, um, we already know this is this isn't hypothetical. We already have a, a fair amount of research that shows uh, smaller household type nursing homes have sig had significantly lower infection and mortality rates during the pandemic. They have lower staff turnover, greater staff longevity. They have higher occupancy rates, even during the, the pandemic. Uh, there's more staff time spent in direct care, particularly when you have universal care workers who are cross-trained. Uh, they, they score higher in multiple quality indicators and, and family satisfaction. 
And actually, our operating costs are, are not that different from the national median value, uh, value for nursing homes. The biggest problem is the cost of converting an existing facility to a new one. That takes money. It takes incentives. Um, yeah, but many folks have been working on this for a long time. Greenhouse homes have been around for 20 years, and they know how to do this. Action Pat, uh, the uh, Pioneer Project, have all been focused on culture change that is allied with the small household model. Uh, and one thing that I, you know, I come from a background in law and elder rights, and I have to always say that think about the situation we have now. We put older, our oldest, sickest people in buildings that were designed on the model of hospitals in the 1960s and 70s. They look and feel like hospitals for the most part. Not all of them, but the majority do. Uh, they're very institutional in their design and feeling and operation. Older sick people are the only group left in our society other than convicted felons in which we use institutional settings for long-term care uh, residential uh, uh, placement of them. And I think that is a, a, a situation that we ought to all find scandalous, uh, but we've come to accept it as a society because we have such low expectations uh, for care of older persons, and we really need to change uh, that whole uh, perspective. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so the action plan that is the combination of the finance committee and our small uh, household model work group has three goals to it. One, supporting efforts to develop and advance state demonstrations of a nursing home conversion to the household model. Uh, number two, convene a roundtable to discuss various strategies to promote more household models. Although I should say that goal two has really been more generalized to really uh, not only conduct roundtables, but to, to talk to other groups who have uh, st uh, or are stakeholders in this process. Uh, we, the uh, coalition has talked to, for example, the Elder Justice Coordinating Council already about our efforts. Uh, they are a coordinating council that was created by the Elder Justice Act, which focuses on primarily on elder abuse, but they also have very great concerns about the quality of care in nursing homes. And 16 different federal agencies are represented on that council. So it was a very important uh, uh, opportunity for education. Um, I think Isaac already mentioned that Alice Bonner is talking to the uh, American Governors Association meeting today. Uh, so uh, convening roundtables, think of that broadly as convening groups, all, all, uh, every group that we can think of that has a stake in this whole issue. And thirdly, identifying, the third goal is identifying and circulating specific recommendation, recommended changes to HUD's Section 232 program. And uh, I'm going to let uh, Mark dive into that. Uh, let me just say one more <laughs> word about um, uh, the focus of our part of the working group. If we go to the next slide. Um, as a practical matter, the action plan uh, I, I conceive of it as having these three elements, connect, connecting multiple influencers, both at the federal level, and you know who many of the players are, CMS, uh, HUD, uh, and many other agencies, ACL, the Veterans Administration, uh, even the Department of Agriculture funds health facilities in rural areas. Um, uh, targeting federal legislators, there has been legislation in the past to provide grants to incentivize small household model conversion. Um, educating our legislators on, on that kind of approach uh, we still are, are doing now. Um, and on the state level, uh, we have been identifying state leaders and influencers who are interested in moving their state policy in this direction and trying to de develop a kind of a critical mass of people who could come together and uh, share uh, what they're thinking, what they can do, and um, share strategies. Uh, and the strategies may involve uh, multiple incentive strategies. Some are listed here, grants, mortgage subsidies, capital uh, assistance, income tax and real estate tax breaks, enhanced payment rates for services uh, um, that's been done in a couple states, uh, waivers of regulatory requirements, such as a certificate of need, that's a CON, um, maybe some state licensing requirements uh, would need to be modified. Uh, and, and at the same time, we are 
beginning to develop uh, for purposes of disseminating case examples of successful conversions of traditional legacy facilities to small household models. And we're, we're beginning to do that because we, we want to kind of demystify this whole process to make show people that it, it can be done. There are practical steps people have gone through. Um, th there are practical ways people have financed it and they are, and they are now doing well, we hope in all cases, but we know in, in most cases they, they are. And um, uh, that might even include uh, examples of the before architectural plans and the after architectural plans to show that, uh, you know, in, in uh, very graphic detail, that, that this is a doable effort and we can make it happen. So having said that, I want to turn to Mark now to talk about our focus with uh, HUD in particular and why we're focusing on HUD. Mark? Thanks, Charlie. Uh, I really appreciate the way you set the table for this. And, um, you know, we're jumping right into HUD. I want to just step back for one second and make the observation that I think many of us who are uh, students of uh, the long-term care services and supports um, uh, arena Think of CMS as the primary funder of nursing homes through the Medicaid program. After all, two thirds of, of residents are, are uh, reimbursed by Medicaid. But HUD has is another very large uh, financer of nursing homes, not through direct patient care, but through the administration of some of its um, loans or guarantees of loans through the Federal Housing Administration. And what I'm talking about here is that uh, HUD basically provides mortgage insurance on loans made by FHA approved lenders. And Section 232 um, is a, a loan that works as follows. So imagine you know, somebody's coming to either develop a nursing home or they want to do a major refinance uh, because they're doing uh, refurbishing and so on. So the lenders will provide the mortgage, which are typically 30 to 40 years in duration. Um, and HUD through the Federal Housing Administration will insure those mortgages. Basically the idea is that the borrower pays mortgage insurance, uh, which is designed to cover the costs of loans that go bad. Now I have go bad in parentheses, that's you know claims that are made. And one of the things, um, is that an FHA insured loan brings attractive market interest rates uh, due to the backing of HUD. Now, you'll notice that it says on the bottom source HUD 2023. I'll talk more about this, but we had the good fortune of being able to make contact um, with um, executives in the Department of Housing and Urban Development who did a really good job of educating us about the program and making some very important connections for us, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So what, is, what are the particulars of the 232 program? So um, here are the primary facilities, not surprising, that receive loans that are insured through this section 232. They're skilled nursing facilities and nursing homes. Um, when I say skilled nursing facilities, that is a, a general rubric includes all nursing homes assisted living facilities and board and care homes, and any combination of these types of facilities. And the activities that are insured through this program include new construction, uh, substantial rehabilitation, and refinance or purchase of existing plant or any combination of those uh, activities. So the total portfolio of um, the insured section is as follows. There are about 3,500 facilities um, across all states. I'm not, I don't actually understand or know why North Dakota doesn't have any, but they don't. Um, the principal, uh, unpaid principal balance of those loans is around close to $32 billion. And you can see the breakdown um, on the other uh, in in the other box. Uh, we're talking about seventy percent of skilled nursing facility uh, nursing homes, um, sixteen percent of the country SNFs, and thirty percent of ALF 
and board and care homes. Now, when we first met uh, with HUD to learn about what the opportunities were for here again, at a high level, the idea is how can we use the substantial financing power of HUD to incentivize some of these small home models, private rooms that, that Charlie has talked about previously. And so we learned in some early meetings with um, some of our, our HUD colleagues that there are three major classes of autonomy and control. There are those actions that require congressional approval. There are those actions that potentially re require broader interagency approval. Maybe you have to get OMB involved and so on. And then there are actions that HUD can take on its own within its own authority. Now, one of the things when, uh, that Isaac, um, I, I'm not sure if he mentioned this or not, but I will, part of our goal in the Moving Forward Coalition is to put forward action plans that we believe actually have a shot at being implemented within a relatively short time frame, meaning within a next a two year period. So when we looked at these major classes of autonomy and control, we click, quickly concluded that our focus needed to be on number three. We need to work directly with the folks at HUD who um, have, it, have it within their own authority to do certain things uh, that could potentially move the needle on the development or refurbishing to small homes, more privacy and so on. So the next question was, well, what are some of those potential administrative and policy levers that we could explore? And um, we were told that um, it would be really good to uh, meet with uh, the leadership of what's called the Healthcare Mortgage Advisory Council, HMAC. Now, this is a nonprofit consortium of FHA approved lenders and industry partners who are active in financing and servicing residential care facilities under the 232 program. And so we met with, we've met with them a number of times to learn about what are the things that um, lenders and operators care about that if changed, could lead to changes in behavior. And we were really, it was such a great recommendation by the folks at HUD for us to talk to these people because they have the deep subject matter expertise in this area. And they were uh, frankly, really excited to work with us. And so we've had a series of meetings with them. And um, what we have learned is that there really are a variety of potential I'm calling them policy and administrative levers that could be pulled to incentivize innovation. And we have classified them under three broad categories. Um, for example, there is reducing loan costs. And I'll just focus on this first one. So in the mortgage insurance program, basically um, lenders have to pay an insurance premium um, and what we thought, and there's precedent for this is, well, if a, a new developer comes along and says, um, I, would, I would like to you know, develop these small homes or spend money to refurbish, to get private, uh, private rooms or private bathrooms or um, certain communal spaces within nursing homes, potentially as a way to incentivize that, the mortgage insurance premium could be reduced on those loans. That would be real money into the hands um, of these uh, developers. And there's actually a precedent for this in um, there are some green initiatives that have been put forward where HUD has reduced the mortgage insurance charge from 75 basis points to 25 basis points. That's you know, just one example. A second example could be potentially reducing debt serve. There are certain requirements for nursing homes. And if we wanted to target um, underserved populations, um, for example, 
than potentially reducing coverage ratios, increasing loan to value ratios. There's um, potentially another way to do this um, or to incentivize these behaviors is through expedited handling and processing of applications. Uh, speed of review, maybe changing certain underwriting requirements. Um, and finally, uh, potentially changing certain criteria or thresholds for what constitutes renovations under a special, it's called a 232F program, refinance program. So we have been exploring right now with HMAC um, and these lenders, different opportunities within, uh, within these broad categories. So where, where are we at? So as I mentioned, we've had an initial and follow-up meetings with individuals at HUD. We have had, uh, I think at least four or five meetings already with executives at, at HMAC. And actually they have a conference that's coming up um, in another month or so. And my, my co-chair David Grabowski and myself are gonna be presenting um, uh, David's going to just talk about nursing homes in, in a keynote and uh, trying to link healthcare so that these lenders can become more knowledgeable about that. We have, HUD has provided us with a lot of material. Uh, we've researched the lender's handbook. Um, and we are in the process now of taking from that list of potential policy and administrative levers and bringing them down uh, to develop a memo to send to our, our, our friends at HUD with specific concrete recommendations to see if we can't um, start working to implement these. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Charlie to talk about progress on other elements of this joint initiative before the, uh, for the two committees, and then we'll have a discussion and open it up for questions. Charlie? Sure, and I'll be very quick here because I've really touched on these already. Uh, we have a small household model work group, uh, which has been expanded to bring as many good minds together as we can. And if there are suggestions from this audience of who should be a part of that, uh, you know, Isaac's the guy to be in touch with. Um, we are beginning to develop an in-depth survey of successful conversions. Uh, we know there are, you know, uh, well, we don't know how many there are, but they, we've already identified uh, probably close to a dozen examples that may be appropriate for a, a survey that would want to look at the issues that they face, the strategies they use, what the differences in uh, uh, finances before and after were, and a number of other uh, parameters, including quality issues, uh, resources that they could draw upon. Uh, political problems they ran into and anything that uh, else that they see relevant. And we are also very heavily involved in identifying and hopefully uh, not too far in the distant future convening uh, state leaders and influencers. And those may be people in the public sector or private sector uh, that have uh, a influential role that are interested in this. Um, and, uh, and finally, we are focusing a lot on educating and supporting new interests and, and efforts at, in, in federal agencies and in Congress, uh, which um, in itself could be fruitful and, and could very much expand what Mark is doing by bringing other agencies into uh, perhaps doing something in coordination with HUD, uh, which would be ideal. So there's where we stand right now. We're at the very beginning of year two, and this is our implementation year of, our, of, our, of these goals. So we have very high expectations. Thanks, Charlie. Isaac, Isaac, I'll turn it over to you. And I'm going to stop sharing, Isaac. We're going to have a discussion, and we already want to thank you in advance for participating. I'll, I'll stop sharing. Thank, thanks, Mark, and, and thanks, Charlie. Um, a, a really uh, ter terrific overview. And I, and I encourage others, um, if you have questions, comments, ideas, um, really anything, everything, feel free to either raise a hand, and, and we can uh, call on you that way, or, or, or put thoughts uh, in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll let folks go ahead and start to ruminate that way. Um, I, I did have some, some you know, pre, pre planned questions for you guys that I'll, I'll pose as folks um, think about uh, 
any interests uh, they may have. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll start, uh, you know, I think the the HUD work is is fairly defined in terms of its its goals, and I'm wondering, Ch Charlie, if you can talk to the group a little bit, you know, uh, more about sort of a, a grand vision for the future, um, and and what uh, the work group imagines the role of of states and and federal uh, leaders uh, could be towards getting there. Well, um, I'm sure many of the audience. Uh, quite familiar with CMS and perhaps the uh, CMS's Innovation Center. There's a lot of opportunities for research and demonstration uh, projects that uh, fund efforts to uh, uh, push push the field in a new direction. And this could be uh, a federal state uh, collaborative effort uh, that any state was interested in, if, if an entity like CMS, or, or maybe HUD would want to try this out with just particular states to start out. Maybe they don't want to roll it out to the whole country. That that might be something we would have to talk about with them. At the state level, uh, you know, states provide a whole variety of incentives for everything from building baseball stadiums and football stadiums to uh, affordable housing and uh, green housing um, and uh, uh, you name it. States in you know. Uh, uh, to, to, to promote business centers, um, revitalize cities. States just do this every day. And if the states could be convinced that uh, eliminating this institutional model of care, uh, which is way past its uh, viable lifetime, uh, is worth putting money into, states could easily provide, for example, we know that uh, I know the state of Arkansas provides an add on for. Uh, facilities that meet the small household model, like greenhouse homes. Um, I understand that uh, Ohio may be doing, uh, has, has legislated something similar that will be coming down the pike. Uh, states may also uh, help a, uh, uh, for, you know, for example, a, a state gets a loan that's um, um, insured by FHA, uh, and maybe the state could also be a partner in that in providing a, a tax break uh, for a certain number of years for a facility that, that does that so that they can manage the cost of the transition, uh, which is really the, the challenge in, in converting models. Uh, so there's really uh, un unlimited creativity that's possible here of, of what incentives would work. Uh, now, we don't know, uh, you know, it's been very helpful on the, on the HUD side with HMAC educating us as to what kind of incentives are meaningful. We don't really have that same sense of feedback yet from, from states and the nursing home industry. And we hope to develop that as we, as we move forward. Charlie, can I just add one point? Thank you for that. Uh, just on that point, Alice and I are, and Isaac, you may be participating as well, um, are going to be meeting with uh, a local uh, mass housing somebody from Mass Housing um, to talk precisely about, you know, what levers are there that can be pulled um, from the, you know, the state housing authority. And um, we, at least here in, in Boston, there's a lot of discussion about what to do with a excess space, for example, commercial space downtown. Um, what are there opportunities right now? We're talking about it in terms of the homeless um, and how to deal with that problem. But I can well imagine that uh, there will be discussions about opportunities for small homes with current infrastructure. Absolutely. Th thank you both. And, you know, I, I see Joanne Lynn, who's part of um, our HUD work group, is, is on the call. Joanne, I don't know if you're in, in a place where you, where you can talk or not, but um, you've helped us think a lot about the the intersection of of nursing home issues um, and and homelessness um, and the impact of nursing home closures um, on, on homelessness. And I, I don't know if you're able to speak, but if you are and wanted to add a little more to that, I uh, would love to hear from you on that. Well, if Joanne can't speak, one thing I would add is that if you have a facility that has, uh, you know, 
uh, capacity for 200 residents. And, and we're asking them to downsize uh, and create small modules within that building, which, which they can do. They could think of doing part of that, part of that building might be converted to a, a low income housing for, for workers who usually can't live in the urban areas where many of these uh, facilities are. I'm in the DC area uh, in, in Arlington, Virginia. And you know the workers who uh, are the aides in nursing homes can't afford to live in a community like ours, but maybe that could be combined in the same building. So just a great deal of creativity is possible here. You know, Isaac, I want to add one more kind of general point about the thrust of not just our action plan, but I think many other groups' action plans. We are, you know, we're focused. Um, we want to make it. We want to make it easy for people to say yes, not to point out the obstacles, the challenges. We're aware of that, and the obstacles and challenges have left us where we are today, which is why we're focused on sort of very practical, granular changes um, that we think are going to going to make a difference. And we want to, for our partners that we're working with, we want to make it as easy as possible to get to yes. So. Charlie, speaking of, you know, I think a great call out uh, about the, the possibilities around workforce workforce housing uh, and integrating workforce housing into existing nursing home stock. Um, and, you know, to, to Mark's point on, on Massachusetts, one, one of the things uh, that he and Alice have, have raised as they've uh, traveled through, through um, Massachusetts is exactly that possibility and tried to see what the opportunities are there. I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, you guys could share some of the other innovations um, in, in nursing homes, physical plants um, that uh, could uh, have other positive benefits that, you know, with the right sort of financing um, and incentives, you know, could, could spring forth, forth and really revolutionize um, what nursing homes mean to their residents in the community at large? Well, you know, we didn't uh, really spend any time explaining in any detail what the small household model is. And for people, I mean, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it, but for those who are not, you know, the original model that was really spearheaded through the Greenhouse Project involved a campus of five or six houses that really looked like houses in your neighborhood that were that were built for no more than 12 residents in single rooms with their own private bathrooms, uh, a real kitchen in the home. You know, when you think about where people spend their time in their home, it's either in their kitchen or their family room, which you use the same space nowadays. And yet um, the home that we give for our older, sickest uh, uh, individuals has, has no access to a kitchen. The kitchen is hidden somewhere in the building and the food's just brought out. Um, so uh, and, and those facilities had outdoor space so with with a lot of easy access to it, but because um, so many uh, nursing homes are in urban areas where you don't have that land to spread out like that, and and they have existing facilities that may be two, three, four, five, even six stories tall. Uh, what do you do? Well, you can build uh, vertically uh, apartment units that are homes, just like the homes that are freestanding uh, and have their own entrance and have many of the same characteristics. So uh, that's the kind of uh, physical plant model that we're aiming at. Mark, I don't know if, if you uh, wanted to add anything to that, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I mean, throw the only, in. I, I have heard some discussion um, and others on the phone or on the on the, the the Zoom may have much more knowledge about this of trying to see how to uh, integrate nursing homes as service hubs to the community. And part of the reason for that is to um, make uh, make it more attractive for workers. Um, and uh, there there may be some examples of that early early models of that. But to so that it's not sort of off isolated outside of the community, it could facilitate transitions between community and nursing home care a little bit more easily. Uh, Dorothy, I see that you've raised your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm 
Well, first of all, in, in Massachusetts, I didn't get to read the coverage. I was traveling, but I gather a large, the large uh, veterans home in Western Massachusetts uh, has announced some plans that seems to involve uh, small, smaller units within, I think, the existing building. Um, and I've been wondering about thoughts that would bring in some of the benefits of, of small group homes, but bring them in in large, larger, uh, even in a corridor. Can't we, can we concentrate on changing the staffing patterns? Can we work on the culture? Can we do things other than that would break up a long corridor into two units in some way that makes sense? And the costs of, of any renovations would be less, less onerous and it would be benefit the workers substantially, which I think should be one of our major goals. So that's my, my input or thought. Uh, thank, thanks for that, Dorothy. I mean, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think we all agree that um, we're gonna move the needle most by working with the existing supply of, of nursing homes. When we're talking about new development, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a while. And some of the changes that you're talking about, major renovations, one of the potential levers that we were think policy or administrative levers is, you know, what constitutes a major repair versus renovation? What programs are these slotted into and so on, precisely to make some of those types of changes? You know, there are uh, traditional legacy homes that have really dived into culture change and have done a great job. But that is always like, it's always an uphill battle. It's like Sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain. And until, when, the, when the real strong advocates disappear from the scene, things fall back down to where they were. And that's why, uh, you know, we are pushing the, the physical plant changes. But as Mark says, there are some things you can do with an existing physical plant, some things you can't do. We wanna see how far we can push the envelope to make those changes. And, and are any of the other task groups um, that are aimed at worker satisfaction and upgrading career ladders, are any of them bringing in uh, the cross-training, the idea of, of, of multiple functions and, and people seem to be much happier in their work. So should, is that gonna be part of their thinking in the other groups? Absolutely. I see, I see, Alice, if you, do you want to chime in on the cross group stuff? Uh, yeah, so hi, everybody. I'm uh, currently at the National Governors Association Workforce Summit in Broomfield, Colorado, near Denver. Um, and specifically, I've spent yesterday and today networking with lots of states and talking with individual states here about what they're doing around workforce. And to your point, um, you know, a lot of the states have these varied programs and they exist, but there isn't a lot of communication about them. So even though they're there, you know, people are saying, you know, the scholarships are not always used or, you know, the, the trainings are not always done um, the way, you know, you all are, we all are talking about it. So I think there is an opportunity and some of it is really around communication and, you know, what some people call marketing, but, you know, we have to spread the word on these programs and you get a huge state like, you know, Florida or New York or Texas and, you know, it's just a lot to pull together all the disparate programs, and some of them are apprenticeships, and some of them are pathways, and they're called different things in the different states. And so, there's a lot of complexity to this. But we are hearing good conversations here about this, and I would say, you know, we 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 can pull this together, and we can take action, and really try to reduce the fragmentation. That's why we're the Moving Forward Coalition, is because you know there's all this great work, but it's just kind of here and there, and so we have a chance to really pull it together. So I don't know if that's helpful, but there is a lot of conversation about that happening here. Thank you. Isaac, you had invited Joanne Lynn to speak up before, and I see she's fully connected now. So maybe you want to go back to that. Absolutely. Uh, Joanne, if you wanted to talk about, I, I had brought up um, homelessness and, and elder homelessness and its relationship to nursing home issues and, and was one I know that's something you've been pretty deeply involved in and was wondering if you want to speak to that for for those who who don't know Joanne is part of our um, finance committee and, and works closely with Mark um, on uh, the HUD work so Joanne please yeah I mean the context always matters and the context that we have to work in is to seriously recognize that the uh, boomer generation 
is just beginning to get large numbers of people um, disabled enough to consider a nursing home. Um, at the same time, they have no financing and the financing is getting worse and worse. So we expect to have, and already are seeing, very large numbers of elderly people who are having to be homeless. Uh, some are um, you know, living in cars or vans, uh, some are living in shelters, uh, but some are just on the street. And that number is going to increase substantially, especially if we continue to lose nursing homes, um, even just as safe refuge. Um, now, many of these folks, if they are not uh, substantially demented, claim that they are going to just kill themselves uh, when they get sick. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't usually work out, but uh, just consider that if you were you know, 88 years old and uh, gradually getting more and more disabled with, say, Parkinson's, uh, but your mind was still pretty sharp and you had no resources beyond maybe $1,000 a month in Social Security, what are you going to do? Um, so, you know, if nursing homes were attractive and affordable and available, um, maybe that would be a refuge. But if not, it's um, it's very challenging as to what you will do. Um, obviously, some states, winter is pretty tough and summer is pretty tough in others. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the context in which we're working is one in which you have to be very careful about actually shutting nursing homes in general. Now, yeah, there's certainly some that deserve to be shut. Um, so, you know, we need to actually somehow expand the number of supportive care um, housing one way or another. And that, that requires, I think, um, much more accessible housing in every community for people who are still capable but need a wheelchair or need um, you know, bathroom accommodations that you know, help them get around. But eventually, you know, half of us who make it to 85 will have cognitive failure. So you know, eventually you need a much more sheltered environment. And um, you know, we need to really be thinking through how to make these improvements in the quality without nailing the quantity, or we will have both larger numbers of elders homeless and larger numbers of elders who simply find a way to be off this mortal coil rather than face what the society has thrown at us, at us, not them, at us. I think it's a it's a great uh, summary and 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 point and as as folks are noting in the chat of of huge concern. Um, I, I think it's also what what lends I think importance to what what Charlie's work group is doing in terms of really convening the state and federal leaders to talk about these issues together. Because you know if 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 we act in silos around around nursing home issues, you do run the risk of you know unintended consequences where you you may be ending up closing more nursing homes than, than you mean to um, and, and leaving folks vulnerable. So, you know, raising the quality of the nursing home stock um, to a, a, a shared discussion across agencies and across states is really vital. Agreed. Kathy just put up a point about the need for uh, people at the state level to be educated about these uh, about these issues. Absolutely right. And I think one of the things that Charlie emphasized um, in, in his talk was the convenings that the Moving Forward Coalition is doing um, across the country and in various forms. And I think what you're saying there, uh, Kathy, fits right in with that. Uh, the need to meet with state officials, educate them. Um, I mean, everybody has a day job and it's hard to get people's attention on these, uh, on these issues.
Joanne. Do you, you want to, uh, or jo Joanne, did you raise your hand or not take it down? No, I raised it again. Um, I think that one of the things we should keep in the back of our minds, we, we need to make these early gains, obviously. We need to have the workforce much more satisfied. We need to have nursing homes that are not hell holes. And, you know, um, so we need to make some big gains right away. But in the longer run, we need, I think, to think of communities and the housing issues, the continuum, that people at 60, 70, maybe 75, are kind of expecting that they will find themselves in a place that is accessible, that has reasonable services, so that they can live in that place much longer into old age. And then there need to be you know, day centers, there need to be um, assisted living for relatively modest needs, and then there need to be very good nursing homes. And we need population-based data to guide that. We need to know how many people are being locked in their room because there's no space in the day center, or how many people cannot tolerate going into the local nursing homes because of their quality or their staffing. Um, so we need an entity, possibly the area agencies on aging, but it could be some, it could be a county agency that would actually monitor how we're doing with this regard. So I think in the long run, we need um, some way to see how your jurisdiction, you know, your geographic area is doing. Um, this is not something to be measured on a state basis or a federal basis, because people are really tied to right where they live. And they really can't bring in a home health aid from 60 miles away. You know, the person's got to live there, got to live somewhere nearby. So, you know, I think in the long run, we need to begin to think about how to develop an entity that would watch over how we're doing. Do Dorothy? Right there, you're able to unmute. Yeah, yeah. The, the local, I really agree with what Joanne said. I think that the local councils and local people should, organizations, leadership, the elected officials should be asked to, to create a monitoring situation for elder care in my local community. I think that would have many benefits. As far as what I raised my hand for, I would love to see a model of things that present how cross training works how worker workers function in a smaller home with regard to the staffing as um, Alice said there are lots of things happening that we don't learn about so in my state I really feel like I'm in Massachusetts but I feel like people are not talking about this it's, it's like no one's thinking about culture no one's thinking about worker roles in this regard they're concerned about pay um, but not about the training of cross training I'd like to have it flushed out somehow. Thank you. Well, th thank you. And I hope you'll join us for some of our workforce dis discussions, much like this uh, coming down the pipeline in September. Um, I'll, I'll put those in the chat before we end, um, because that's exactly what that group is doing um, and thinking about uh, career pathways uh, for uh, direct care workers. Um, uh, in, in addition to thinking about wages. So, you know, thinking about both of those issues together and, and trying to create real uh, action uh, on both levels. Uh, so we have just five minutes left. Oh, go ahead, Charlie. Or One of the vehicles, just to follow up on Joanne's uh, comments, that uh, occurs to me in my local community, which has this age-friendly certification that um, uh, AARP has established. And there are scores of communities around the country who have uh, uh, sought it and achieved it. But um, as our community goes through uh, doing a new age-friendly plan, it occurs to me that they never thought about the issues that Joanne has talked about. They, I mean, they, they don't think of age-friendly uh, going up to the, the nursing home level. You know, nursing homes are often seen by local communities as being, well, the feds take care of that. We really don't have any, any control over that. And uh, we need to get communities to start taking uh, ownership of the quality of care uh, at, at that highest level of, of care. And, and um, 
I know in my local community, I'm going to make sure that uh, age friendly includes uh, nursing homes that are humane places to live, which we do not have right now. Beautifully put, um, and I think a, a really strong place to end. So I have two calls to action to this group, um, and uh, and then want to uh, off, offer it to uh, Jane Carmody from the John A. Hartford Foundation, who is our senior pro program officer, um, to uh, uh, offer in any last words. Um, the two calls to action are, are, are one, if you know a, a, a state uh, leader or influencer who's who's interested in making progress on this work, but maybe looking for a community uh, to learn more about how to do that or or has done made some progress and wants to share it with others, um, please uh, let us know. We'd love to get in touch with them. Um, the, the second call to action is, is similar. Um, if you know of a nursing home that's that's and in particular transitioned a legacy uh, facility or, or physical plant to a um, household model or smaller um, home model or, or a model with private rooms, made some sort of transition to their existing plant, uh, we'd love to know who they are um, and, and to talk to them as well because we'd love to share uh, their example. So um, I'll put my email in the chat for folks who might want to um, share that information. Um, the, the last note for me is that uh, we'll continue to have these coalition conversations on, on our other action plans. You can find them on our website, which I'll also post. Um, and uh, Jane, I don't know if you, you wanted to share any final words, but we're so grateful for, for your support and uh, for your partnership through all of this. Oh, I got to ask you to unmute. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. I, was thinking, I know you don't have much time. Um, this was so great and as all of them have been and i learned so much and i and i thought there's such great promise in the work with the hmac uh and working with hud and re repositioning um, um nursing homes into into better into better environments but i really loved also the link you know nursing homes aren't part of the community it seems they're not part of the health system and so what are they part of? And we need to be, they need to be in great. Whoever said it was just brilliant. They, we, we, they just need to be included in all of it. Um, and I love the local, Joanne's always got lots of great, great things for measuring at the local level and, um, and uh, local regulators. But I did love that, turning some of that bigger spaces into housing. I mean, talk about when we talk about workforce, and talk about you know wages and pay and and uh, career paths. I just really thought that was a brilliant idea as well. Anyway, thank you so much. It's a privilege for the foundation to support this great work and making strides each and every single day. And Alice, I'm so excited. We are with the governors. That's so exciting. And so I think, of course, thank you for all you do to organize this. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Charlie, and, and Mark, for all your work on this and, and leadership. Um, and uh, I will look forward to checking in with you guys uh, in another forum later later on in the year. Uh, so you can hopefully share how you've completely transformed uh, the nursing home stock in, in just six months. <laughs> Only with your help, Isaac. I'll, I'll make sure to schedule all the calls. All right. Thanks, all. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, everybody. Good to Fair see everybody. Nice.